All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to introduce Alicia Katz Pollock, uh, who has agree generously agreed to give us an hour of her time today and help us understand 10 things that you didn't know were in QBO. Now, Alicia, you and I have known each other for very many years mm -hmm. and many, many years. And I'm always amazed at how you find these things. So, and the way that you bring these things to life so that everybody can understand why these features are important. Mm -hmm. So I know you've got a huge amount of things. You've got 10 things that you're going to cover. It's really hard to come up with just 10. <laughs> oh, you'll probably throw in some extras too. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and go on mute and I'm going to turn, it, turn the floor over to you. And folks, I will be in the background answering chat. Every once in a while, you might hear me pop in. And Alicia, just let me know if you want any help at all with Q&A and when you want to take the Q&A, because I'm, okay. I'm here to help. All, all right. right. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is Alicia Katz Pollock, and welcome to 10 Things That You Didn't Know Were In QBO. So this course kind of stems from a project that I have called Look What I Found, which I've actually trademarked the name. And so I'm using QuickBooks day in and day out that my firm is doesn't... I do bookkeeping, but I don't focus on bookkeeping. What I do is setups and training and troubleshooting. And so I'm in Q QBO day in and day out with all kinds of different clients. And so I'm always like, as soon as I see something that's different than it was yesterday, I usually take a screenshot of it, see if it's universal, and then put it out to people to let people know that I find it. So every time I do that, I have a Facebook group, group called Training for QuickBooks Users, and I do it in a couple other places. And so I always label it with, look what I found. And so Allison follows that, um, is in that group. And so she saw me kind of accumulate these and said, well, I think this would be a great topic for growth. So here we are. So thank you for joining us. So let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit about me while people are settling in. I mean, a lot of you know me, but there's a lot of names on this list that I don't know. And so my name is Alicia Katz Pollock, and I will be your tour guide today. I have a master's in teaching. I actually started out as a seventh grade English teacher, but I find this way more re rewarding. I'm a member of Intuit's Trainer Writer Network, and so I speak at QuickBooks Connect and Scaling New Heights, and I do the, the road show and the, tra the free trainings at qbtraininggevents.com for certification. I also have written several QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop textbooks for Questiva Consultants. And in 2021, I was a top 10 pro advisor from Insightful Accountant. So that's enough about me. Let's go ahead and why are you here? So here is a short list of the things that I am going to be talking about. I've got some new developments in QuickBooks payments, some new developments in sales tax, so, uh, a new search window, a new feature called deferred revenue recognition. I'll talk about a couple hidden features that you might not notice that aren't necessarily new, but people don't seem to know that they're there, like the recent automatic transactions report. There's uh, all the buzz this week about the business network, so I'll talk about that. And then in the banking feeds, uh, some of the new enhancements that we'll find there. And then I'm also going to share an extra trick. It's kind of, I think this is number 11, because my speaker goes up to 11. I'm going to show you a cool tip for adding rows to your bundles. So those are the things that we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you are welcome to ask questions. If you are live on the Zoom, there's a Q&A button in your Zoom controls, and that's a great place to ask your questions. And anytime you see me looking over here, I'm keeping an eye on questions that you're asking me. Um, and the um, oh, somebody asked about the Facebook group is training for QuickBooks users on Facebook. So um, this is interactive. When you have questions, you're welcome to ask. And if there's any time at the end, I'll go ahead and I'll take questions and kind of maybe talk about some more things. Now, throughout the presentation today, keep a, an eye out for these roadmaps. Um, I teach a lot of different QuickBooks classes, and I have my own QuickBooks um, training channel. And so you'll see links to some of the other courses. So if you're interested in learning more, you can um, screenshot the little QR codes or write down the links. Okay, so let's start with QuickBooks checking. And 
um, and we're going to check out what it can do. Now, QuickBooks Checking is a built-in checking account that comes inside your QuickBooks Online. And I, when I'm looking in social media, I see a lot of confusion around it that when Intuit first introduced it, they were a little heavy handed with it and kind of just like made it, you could sign up for this checking account with just a click or two. And people didn't realize that they were signing up for an actual bank checking account. So they have completely changed how that works. But there is a financial, a fintech financial technology checking account inside your QuickBooks. And I use it and I have to admit, I really like it a lot. So I wanted to show it off a little bit and show what it can do. So the QuickBooks checking account itself, um, actually this is getting a, a, a little ahead of it once I start talking about the features. So let me just back up for a second. So the QuickBooks checking account is a great place that if you have QuickBooks payments, they can automatically go into the QuickBooks checking account. You can transfer the money out to your operating account. You can pay your payroll right through it. And the QuickBooks checking account is, um, you can, um, there's even a new look what I found that I just found yesterday that I didn't have built into the chat, into the deck, but you can even go in through your phone app and take pictures of your checks and make deposits and deposit money from your paper checks into QuickBooks checking. So really, really happy for that new development. Um, I believe that this is just in the U.S. If um, any of the Canadians, if you have QuickBooks checking up there, let me know, but I think it's just in the U.S. Now, some of the features about QuickBooks checking in this, why would I even want to use it? One is that you can do instant deposits. So when um, when people pay through QuickBooks payments, then you can connect it to your QuickBooks checking account, and then you can get instant payments. So instead of having to wait three or five days for your credit card for your client's credit card to clear or for their ACH to clear, you can get it within hours. So the, the way that you set this up is you make sure that you have signed up for the QuickBooks checking account and that your QuickBooks payments deposits into your QuickBooks checking account. And then you can, there, you'll see little links around that say, do you want instant deposits? And when you say yes, it will ask which bank account you want. And then it leverages a debit card to do it, your QuickBooks checking account comes with a, a physical debit card as well. And so the way that they work it is they put the deposit to the debit card and then they put it into your checking account. What's really cool about this is that there's no extra fee. Instant deposits is available to anybody, but usually they charge you an extra 1% to get the money now. When you have QuickBooks checking connected, there's no extra fee. So basically, I run charges for my clients and they show up within hours. And so I always have the money as soon as I receive it, which is really awesome. Alicia, we've got two yeah. questions that I think uh -huh. are really relevant to take now. Yeah. Um, Christine's asking, is QuickBooks checking account, account only for QBO accountant? It's and then there's a secondary question. Oh, three questions. Okay. One from Steve, is this Canada or USA? And then anonymous person, does the QB checking account support hemp businesses? Okay. So those so let three. Me, let me take all three of those. So I don't know if it's in Canada. I think it's just in the US, but if any of you are Canadian and have QuickBooks checking, please do um, let me know, put it in the thing and, and confirm that for me. Uh, it is, as far as supporting hemp businesses, I don't think that QuickBooks Payments and Intuit is supporting hemp businesses yet. So you'd have to try. Worst case scenario, you apply and they reject you, but you should try it. I think the checking account, I don't actually know. I have a feeling you can get the checking account, but I'm not sure if you can use uh, QuickBooks Payments yet. Um, I think that will change. Um, there's a question of... Um, is it QBO account only? No, it's not. It's QuickBooks. It's, it's all QuickBooks users. In fact, that's one of the things that's a little tricky about it is that the QuickBooks 
checking account can only be controlled by a regular user or an administrative user. A QuickBooks Online accountant who is going into their client's deck uh, or, or into their file can't actually make any transfers or see the statements. And they do that for security reasons because it is a full-fledged checking account right inside the QuickBooks. And so it's a little awkward for the bookkeeper who's helping a client with QuickBooks check uh, QuickBooks checking. I actually, if I have a client using QuickBooks checking, <laughs> I actually keep their um, user login under lock and key in my one password in case I have to get in to use it. Um, so let's see other, now the questions are pouring. Yeah, in. we may have to, <laughs> I think we opened up Pandora's box here. Yeah. Um, okay. if um, you feel like you don't have enough time, Alicia, we can come back to these later. Okay. So let me, let me zoom through them. QuickBooks checking. There is no way to deposit cash, just checks. Um, I actually, wait, I take it back. You do get a debit card and you can probably use your debit card in ATMs and do it that way, but there's probably a $3 fee or, you know, some sort of fee like that. Does QuickBooks still have a 50 K limit for money transfers? Yes, they do, but you might be able to talk to underwriting and get it lifted. If you routinely have really large dollar amounts and you can prove that it's a regular thing, like you can give them three months of statements, they'll probably be able to lift that. Uh, how's the customer support relating to QB payments? It's the same support. It's all through uh, QBO. Um, and there is no charge to transfer money out of QuickBooks checking into an external account. You can totally just do that anytime you want to. All right. Gotcha. All right. So going back to the instant deposits, one of the things that's nice, you can either do an instant deposit on demand or you can actually schedule them and you can say, I want to do it every day. Like, why wouldn't you, right? But maybe you'd only want to do it on Fridays so that you get your money without having to wait through the weekend. Okay. Another benefit of QuickBooks checking is that you can make a uh, envelopes. It was five. I think it's up to 10 envelopes now. For those of you following Profit First, it's perfect because it's all in one checking account, but then you have all of your different envelopes lined up and the envelopes get 1.75% interest, APY. So it's not 1.75 a month, it's 1.75 divided by 12, but that's higher interest than I get from my Bank of America account. So I have actually started using my QuickBooks uh, checking account as my company's savings account. And I just sock every penny that I can into one of the envelopes. I save it up for payroll. Then I take it out to pay payroll. I save it up for taxes. I take it out to pay taxes. And I save it for the summer when my time is slow so that I have a reserve. So the 1.75% is fantastic. Um, I do have a note on here. Be very careful about your, your balances. I have found that when you look at QuickBooks checking by going to cash flow and checking, it shows you one balance. But if you look in your banking feed um, and then go into the bank register, you might see slightly different fees or numbers there because of um, payments that haven't cleared yet. And so I generally look in both places as I'm trying to decide how much money I have to move around. So you don't want to bounce any anything because you have something pending. Okay. So um, uh, Laura asked, are the envelopes difficult to reconcile? You actually don't reconcile the envelopes at all. You only reconcile the main checking account. Okay. Um, the, the main account does not have interest. It's only the envelopes. Um, and somebody's asking, what do I mean by envelopes? So envelopes are basically sub accounts of the checking account. Let me go back again. Uh, sub accounts. So here you can see the main checking account and then the envelope. So you can do money that you've put away for um, for tax uh, taxes, for payroll. There's even a smart sales tax envelope, but I've honestly never seen it actually working where they say that every time somebody pays sales tax, it will put it in this envelope and then you can pay the sales tax right out of that envelope. I don't know if it actually works or not. Okay. Um, I do need to move on. I could talk about checking the, the whole time, but I have nine more things, nine more things. See? Okay. So the next thing that I wanted to let you know is when you are wondering about your QuickBooks payments and how, what are the fees that you're actually paying? If you go into the gear and then account and settings and then um, payments, you can see your statements 
And the statements, um, when you go to view your statements, if you look down at the very bottom, there's a whole section here that shows every kind of transaction that you've had, the fees that you were charged, the per transaction fee, and then it, um, and then if you're paying a monthly service fee because your volume is high, you have all of that. So you can see here at the very, very bottom, the aggregated fee percentage, where right here it says 2.75. And so in the case of this account, even after these transactions happening at 1% and these transactions happening at 2.9%, the whole aggregate was 2.75%. And so if you were comparing this to PayPal or Square, that's where you would get that comparison. So um, this is a really handy place to go. All right. The next thing that I want to go into is new QuickBooks Online features, or actually before I go on to that, um, if you do have other questions and you want to reach me outside, I'll give my contact information at the end and we can pick up this conversation later on. All right, here we go. Okay, the next things that I want to talk about are some new features in QuickBooks Online, things to keep an eye out for. Some of these haven't been rolled out universally yet, and so you may not even see them. The first one is sales tax. There is actually um, sales tax nexus tracking now in your QuickBooks Online, and I've had three different clients get emails that say, um, you have now reached nexus in North Carolina, and now they have to go start collecting sales tax in order to um, stay in compliance. So it's really cool that the sales tax module is keeping an eye on, have you had enough sales, um, volume of sales, dollar amount of sales in different states that it now requires requires you to start submitting sales tax, which is just absolutely amazing. Now I have a copy of QuickBooks open. I want to see if that's an, in my sample file or not. Some of them have it and some of them don't. And it does not look like this one does. Okay. So um, I can't give a, a picture of the screen, but when you go into the sales tax center, you're going to see a new button at the top that says sales tax nexus. And it's a report that shows your sales across all the locations so that you can keep an eye on it yourself. So super awesome. Very, very happy to, to know that. And one of the questions that my clients ask all the time is, well, wait, I didn't collect sales tax in those states. As far as I know, it's not until you reach Nexus that you do need to start. So you don't have to like all of a sudden pay taxes for sales that you didn't collect sales tax. It's only moving forward. Yeah. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to the sales tax sisters. If you guys, if you guys don't know them, follow them on Twitter. Um, they're amazing. They actually do a lot of education. If people don't know what a Nexus is, or, or when it applies or what to do. Um, look up the sales tax sisters and follow them. They've got a lot of a lot of free training on that and it's they're, they're a pretty good resource. Yeah, that's Mary Thomas. Yeah, Mary and Stephanie Thomas. Yeah. They're awesome. Yeah. yeah, excellent. And then I do also have a class on how sales tax works in QuickBooks Online. That's the link and the QR code are right down at the bottom. Now, one of the things I also want to say about sales tax that is a big change from when it first was released is that now they have a vast list of types of taxes. And so it's almost not enough anymore to just mark something as taxable. You want to actually go into each product or service and say what the product is, because some products are taxable in one state and not another state, or some are taxable under this location, but not this one or this circumstance, but not not this one. And so by actually specifying what the tax is, then it will help your accuracy immensely. So um, I do talk about that in the class. You don't have to, um, Annette is asking you, do you have to activate the sales tax nexus? It's just automatic. It just is now a thing. All right. So that was sales tax nexus. Okay. Something else that is new is there is a new search. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate this one. So I've just pulled up my QuickBooks online. Let's go ahead and make that a little bigger. So one thing that people don't, not everybody knows about this search up in the magnifying glass up here in the upper right is that you can literally search for anything in here. If you put a dollar sign in front of it, it'll look for dollar amounts, you know, things like that. But what is new is this new advanced search. They have completely updated the search and I really, really like it. The two things that I want to really call your attention to is, well, actually a lot of things. 
but there's a general search up here at the top, and there's also an amount search over here. So if you're looking for a specific dollar amount, that's the total of the transaction. So for example, I put in a hundred, oh, come on, you should be doing this for me. Put in a hundred, not working. That's what I get for using a sample file in a live class, right? Okay, here we go. So the this transaction search is pulling up a hundred and here's two $100 transactions. Um, it's actually being activated by this amount right here. I'm going to turn that amount off and look at this. Another one came up here for $108. And so this amount box on the upper right is the whole transaction grand total. This box up here will literally search anything in a transaction. It will search the memos. It will search the descriptions. It will, um, and then here I can see that, okay, this is $108. When I look at it, that's because the product itself was 100 and then there was $8 tax applied. So you get this really nice either or effect happening from this top search box. You can also have multiple levels. Like I can say, all right, I want to just find invoices that have, um, have uh, $80. And so now it will go in and only show me the invoices for eighty dollars. So and the Alicia, there's some questions coming in about how you how you access that advanced search. Is that the additional yeah. filters there? It's up on the magnifying glass, and, and then, then way down, down the bottom, advanced search. Great. Thank you, everybody, for asking that question. I think that was a really good one to ask. Yeah, this is why I like it being interactive. Thank yeah, you. Dan's saying, got it. Yay. I think people are trying this as they're, they're I think they're trying along at home as we're going along. <laughs> okay, awesome. Pretty funny. Yeah. yeah excellent. Okay. So, um, and then, you know, contact, you can search by customer or vendor. You can search by ID number. You um, And so this way you can search for a specific date range. And so you can layer as many different searches on top of each other as you can, which is a big improvement over the old search where you could only search for one thing at a time. Okay, so that is the search. Okay. Next thing I want to show you is a report called Recent Automatic Transactions. And so if you've all if you've been wondering what's happening behind the scenes inside your QuickBooks Online, there's a report for anything that the system is doing behind your back. Now, again, I'm using a sample file, so I can't promise what my results are going to be. But if I go to the reports center, and I'm just going to shortcut, I'm going to use the find right here and just type in automatic or even just AU. Here's recent automatic transactions. And this is a sample file, so I don't know, I didn't know that if anything was going to come up. But generally what this will find are transactions that were automated through QuickBooks payments, through imports, through any kind of automations that you have happening on the back end. It will go ahead and show you what the system did for you. So in this case, with my QuickBooks payments, this is showing me all of the sales receipts that it were saved as recurring transactions that automatically ran and charged their card. And then it also put in all of their matching deposits. So it's showing me what happened with the sales that I didn't even touch. Set it once, forget it, and there they go. Um, and this is in all subscription levels. Yes. Okay, uh, now let's talk about the business network. And the business network is um, is brand new. It's been in development for a while. I was actually one of the beta testers in it. And is this is uh, some um, sorry, I was looking at the looking at the questions here. Um, the yeah, some folks don't see the advanced search. So I was wondering if maybe it's because you're in QBO Advanced. It just student, might not have been rolled out, or maybe not rolled out yet. Server. Yeah. yeah. So it's coming, guys. It's, yeah, it's, it's it'll be coming. coming. Yeah. And that's one of the caveats that Alicia, because she finds things so early that you probably don't. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. We're getting people Hopefully. chiming in Hopefully. saying it's there. It just looks different. <laughs> Thank you into it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the business network. This is another topic that needs a little bit of context. So the business network is a backend database 
behind the scenes in your QuickBooks, where Intuit has realized that they've got all different QuickBooks users, millions of QuickBooks users. And in order to save you time, they're making it so that you can create a new vendor or create a new customer, and it will actually search its database for companies also using QuickBooks who have opted in. Um, and then when you add in their company name, it will search the database and say, oh, is this it? And then autofill their email and their phone number and their contact information. However, when it autofills it, it only masks it. You can see here on the slide, like I, I tested the, that, this out with Lysio. And it brought up an email address, but I can't see the email address. And it put in a phone number, but I can't actually see the phone number. But then at the bottom, there's an invitation to connect. And so that's where the opting in comes in, that when I attempted to uh, fill this in with Lysio, it's now going to invite them. And they have to say yes to the invitation. And if they say yes to the invitation, then my contact will become a full-fledged contact with everything available to me. And so if they don't, I think you still have to go in and type in the information if you really want it. But the idea is that as more and more people opt into this, it, it saves you time from having to type all of this in yourself. Now, if they haven't given you permission yet, one of the things I discovered today was when I tried to email an invoice to the customer, because I didn't have a full-fledged email address, it wouldn't send the email. So I would have had to ignore this and go ahead and put in the email address if I, if I need to start sending them information now. Uh, but ideally, the idea is that in the big picture, this is kind of their fantasy, and this has not rolled out yet, this is what they have said they are working on, is the ability that, for instance, if I create an invoice to a client and the client is in the network, the bill will show up in their QuickBooks automatically for them to pay. They don't have to get it through their email and then hand input it. It will just go ahead and show up. Or if somebody sends me an invoice, it'll show up in my QuickBooks as a bill. And I think that is um, a, a really, really cool idea. I think it's going to be a while until it's implemented the way that that everybody feels good with it and trusts it. But I think it's a really super cool time-saving idea. Um, and so uh, it, so Michael's asking, what account does it use to post the expense to? First of all, it's not out yet. And uh, second of all, that's a really good question. How would it know? Um, I, so I don't know. I, that's why it hasn't been released yet. This is just their idea that they are working on. Uh, does the business network also bring in EIN numbers for 1099 prep? I don't know. I think think it does. I think that is one of the things that they are working on. In fact, they want to set it up so that it has automatic W9 capability as well. So wouldn't that be cool? You add a vendor in through the network, it knows if they're 1099 eligible and sets them up. Pretty slick. But I don't think we're going to see this really full-fledged for a couple of years, but just know that they are, are working on it. So there's that. Um, you can turn on the business network yourself when you're in your account and settings. I believe it's on the advanced tab. Uh, there's a place where you can um, opt in or opt out of the feature altogether. So there's that level as well. Okay, keeping going. Um, I want to change topics. And <laughs> Jennifer says, I wish we could opt out of 1099s altogether. Yeah. Don't get me started on that soapbox. That's a whole, that's my 1099 class where I soapbox about that. All right. Another new feature, deferred revenue. I am really excited about this one. This is only available in QuickBooks Online Advanced, and it's probably not available in Canada yet, but I'm sure it will be someday. And so what deferred revenue is, is this is particularly good if you have subscription-based customers or if you have customers paying you in lump sum payments that instead of recognizing it all in one month, you would rather see it spread out over time. So for example, um, we have uh, subscribers to the Royal Wise Owls who will pay me one lump sum for their whole year. And instead of having these giant lump sums showing in my income all in January, I wanna see that revenue throughout the spread out through the year. 
So the way that you do that, what you're looking at on my slide is a cut of the products and services pane. And when you set up a, a service item, it now has an option in QuickBooks Online Advanced only to turn on reven revenue recognition. And you, when you put a check mark in front of, I recognize revenue for this product monthly, what it does is it creates a deferred revenue liability account. And so you're basically now not recognizing that lump sum payment at all this month. You're, it, it's only gonna be recognized throughout the year. Then you put in your interval. Is it monthly? Is it quarterly? Is it annually? And then what's the duration that you want it spread out from? So basically, you can take this annual service contract and you can spread it out over 12 months. And then the whole um, amount goes into the deferred revenue. And then QuickBooks will automatically make a journal entry every single month to recognize one twelfth of that revenue in that month. And then there's literally nothing else that you need to do. It will go ahead and spread it out for you. So this is fantastic for um, uh, grants, for subscriptions. Um, and um, I personally really want to see this for prepaid expenses as well. You know, I, I, a lot of the time I will subscribe to expenses on an annual basis and use my prepaid expenses so that I can spread it out through the year. So put in feedback that you want to see deferred expenses as well. I want to turn my attention over to your list of questions. We've got a, hey, this is phenomenal. How does it know when to start the 12-month period? It starts immediately. Um, it starts it on the I believe the first of the month. Actually, I don't know what the timing is, um, but it does start it immediately. Okay, and um, Dolores points out for cash basis, deferred revenue is irrelevant because the income is always reported in the year it's received for tax purposes. So this would be something that is um, usually on an accrual basis. Um, and Ryan's asking, is it only on time intervals? Can you do it on percentage of work completed? basis. Now this is just time intervals, but put in feedback. Maybe they can do it in different ways. Okay. And uh, Donna's asking, does it happen by dollar amount? That's what it is actually doing, is um, taking a look at the total dollar amount and dividing it by 12. Okay. Awesome questions. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at the banking feed. So um, I am a huge proponent of the banking feeds. I love the banking feeds, but as you know, they are either your best friend or your worst nightmare. And the banking center takes training both for you, but also for the software itself, that it really depends on the artificial intelligence. And to this end, you know, this is, a, I'm not giving a lesson right now on how to use the banking feed. I do have a whole two hour class just on the banking feed, but they are making it um, um, more and more effective and more and more dummy proof as we go. So uh, let, let me show you some of the new things here that they're working on. So the first thing is that they have changed how the connections operate, that in the past you had no insight to the banking connections, but now they've set it up so that you can actually see all of the banks or all of the accounts at a particular bank, and then it's got sliders to turn them on and off. So if you connect a bank and then you realize, oh, shoot, this is really personal, you can just turn it off. Or if you connected to the bank and you find that, oh, shoot, I really do need this one, you can then turn it on. It's also great if the if the banking accounts have changed. Maybe they've added a new banking, a new bank account. You don't have to start over again with a fresh connection. Now, let me see if this is going to show up in this sample file. I'm not sure if it is. But where you find it is under link account. Ah, oh, good. Here it is. So under link account, there's a drop down arrow. And then there's manage connections. And uh, because it's a fake file, it's not here. But what you would see is an image that looks just like this. So you would see 
um, a row for your Bank of America, your Wells Fargo, your City Card, your um, your Chase, all of the different banks. And then when you click on it to open it up, it will show you all of the bank accounts that are connected to that uh, username and password that you put in originally. And then you can simply use the sliders to um, connect and disconnect. Um, totally works with credit cards, works with sub cards, uh, works with all of them. And it's a great way of fixing those broken bank feeds that a lot of the time you can just come in here. And my recommendation is turn them all off and then turn them all on again. And sometimes that resets the, the connection. When If you are going to take that approach, though, make sure you don't have old transactions still unaccepted on the banking feed because if they're really old and you disconnect, you'll actually lose those. So I only disconnect after I've added everything and they're all in there, but then you can disconnect. Um, if this turning sliding on and off doesn't work, if you like, you know, we've had trouble with Wells Fargo for the last couple months. Some of you have had it intermittently disconnect. What I usually do in that time is I'll go through and I'll disconnect all of the bank accounts from that, from let's, I'll use Wells Fargo as the example. I'll go in and um, you, even beyond this, like not just sliding them on and off, I'll actually go and edit their chart of accounts card and cl click or, un or click the uncheck the disconnect on save and then disconnect it, but then do it for all the accounts at that particular connection. So like all the Wells Fargo accounts, and then go ahead and log into Wells Fargo again and turn them all on again. And I find that if you're trying to fix your connections, doing them all at once works a lot better than just one at a time. So um, yeah, people are saying on here that um, Wells Fargo is, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's the worst. Wells Fargo used to be one of the best. And I think what happened is they changed their security protocols, which is good, but it's not yet playing well with QuickBooks, which they're still working out, but it's getting better than it was. Okay, so that's manage connections. Now, another one that I'm really, really happy about is the categorization history that um, when I've been working in the banking feed and I'm looking at the transactions, you know, like it, for mine, I know what they are, but when I'm working on a client who I'm only in their books, um, you know, once a month or sometimes once a quarter, I don't remember what, how we usually categorize something. And so in my, in the past, what I used to do was have my banking feed up in one tab and my vendors list up in a second tab. And then I would see what the vendor was and go to the other tab and look up the vendor and see what the transactions are, and then go back to the banking tab and put it in. Now there's a categorization history. So when you see Amazon, you can see what all the different Amazon options are and you can pick them. So uh, let, let me show you what that one looks like because I can actually demonstrate this one. So I'm going to head into the banking feed right here. And I've got um, A1 rental, right? So if I click on that, it you might not, you won't see it until you've categorized something the first time. So if you don't see categorization history, it might be a new vendor or you won't see it until you put the vendor's name in here. So if I take that vendor name out, it goes away. But once I say, oh, I know this is A1 rental, I can go ahead and put in A1 rental. And unfortunately it doesn't usually autofill the category up here, but now you have this categorization history link. And when I click it, it will now give me a list of all the different ways that I have categorized it. So for example, like if it's Amazon, it could be office supplies, it could be computer equipment, it could be repairs and maintenance, it could be a lot of different things. So you can see what all the different categories that are ever used. And you can also see that there's a most used and a most recently used in case it changed over time. And then you can pick which one you want, and um, then it will um, it'll put a dot in front of it. And you can see down here at the bottom, I have the option now to even create a rule if I want to, which I'm not going to right now, but I am going to just assign that category. And then boom, it assigns the category for me, and then I can finish the ad. 
So, um, and Crystal's also suggesting that you, if you accidentally categorized it wrong in the past, then it even gives you, it makes it a little easier to find those so you, that you can fix them. So I really like that it's made your history accessible right here instead of having to have a second tab open. And uh, this isn't new, but I want to make sure that everybody here knows that when you're using QuickBooks Online, absolutely use multiple tabs. It makes it so much easier. And so if I am in my banking feed and I do want to see my vendors, you can do this in a couple different ways. My favorite way is just to right click on it and then open it in a new tab. And now I have my vendors list right here. And then I've got my bank transactions and my vendors handy, and I can move back and forth between them. So um, there's another one of my little hoot tips for you. So love categorization history. Something else that is brand new is the ability to view your deposit slips and your check images. And unfortunately, we don't have this in the sample file, so I can't demonstrate it. But it's just rolling out. It's brand new. It's only for some banks and not others. So you won't see it on all files for a while yet. Uh, but it's... Um, what you'll know you have it because you can see down in the banking feed under um, add attachment, you'll now see bank attachments and you can click on each bank attachment and it will open it up on the right hand side. And then you can zoom in so you can see it, you can slide it around. And so now you can see exactly what the check was and you can categorize it while you're looking at it. Oh my God, right? Uh, and so the um, it'll also have deposit slips. And so I always train my business owners if they are going to the bank and using deposit slips to next to the dollar amounts on the list to put at least the initials of who paid so that you can cross reference them. But it, so it's nice that you can see the deposit slip or you can see the checks here. And then you can just move from one to the other to the other that if you have a deposit that's made up of five checks, you can see all five individual checks here so that you can make your deposits. Um, it's pretty amazing. It's amazing. Hey, Alicia, just really quick, just for housekeeping. There yeah. are a couple of people that um, want to be entirely focused on your presentation and not see the chat. Okay. So if they don't want to see the chat popping up, if you click the little carrot, the little up arrow next to the chat window, there's a little thing that says show chat previews. If you unclick that, if you take put your cursor on that little arrow and unclick it, you will not see that the, your, the chat won't pop up, pop up anymore and you will have to go to the chat if you want to see it. So I just wanted to come off because there was two or three people that were like, I can't keep up. <laughs> there's the chat coming up. And so I totally understand you want to see everything and absorb what Alicia is saying. So hopefully that works for you. I tested it. It worked for me. Okay. So, yeah. But everybody is loving this, Alicia. Keep going. I, I just want to help the people that were maybe getting a little bit behind here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excellent. Excellent. And this is being recorded. And so, you know, I am kind of fire hosing you with a lot of different things. And so you will be able to go back later on and focus on like just that little piece that you need for sure. A um, couple of the other questions that are are coming up is, um, can you enable the banking feeds to classify things by items and projects, uh, products and services instead of just categories? Ryan, you are after my own heart. Please put in feedback. I'm going to get right in your face. Please put in feedback on this one because I really would love to be able to not just put in the chart of accounts category, but put in items right at this level. You can do it with... Um, with PayPal, why can't we do it with um, the regular banking feed? At least a button down here, down here, like we'd have on PayPal, where you can have details and put in the products would be super handy. So everybody, please put in feedback about that and make that happen for me. Okay, so that was the check images. All right, and so I've actually been buzzing through faster than I had planned to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, show you my last um, last little bit here and kind of do my wrap up, but then I'm going to stay on for this full hour. And let's go back to QuickBooks checking because that was a hot topic with a lot of questions. And I've seen some questions come in about the business network. So I'm going to kind of go back around again on that. 
Um, but let me show you my last who tip and then we'll go back and do that. So one thing that I wanted to show you, this is not new, but this is one of my favorite techniques is that you can, if you are doing billing for a client where you're accumulating time charges or accumulating billable expenses, and you're pulling them in from those unbilled charges onto the invoice, but you don't want them to see that itemized list with all of that detail. You only want them to see a lump sum for the grand total. Here is your solution for this. So the um, I learned this from Stacy Kildall. And what, what I do is in the products and services, I create a bundle. And I create a bundle that it has unchecked so that it's not displaying the contents of the bundle. And then you can drag in your individual line items, and then that will create a grand total without showing all of the detail. I think this is actually worth demonstrating. So let me explain what I mean by all of this. So the first thing that I'm going to do is go into my products and services list. And I'm going to go to new in the upper corner and I'm going to create a bundle and I'm going to call this billable expenses. And let's see if I can spell expenses right. X Ben says, there we go. And I'm going to display the bundle. No, I'm not. I'm going to keep unchecked display bundle components when printing or sending transactions. So I'm just making a blank just like this. And then I'll save and close this. And let's see if this file has any. Okay, so there's a couple unbilled activities in here. So Amy's Bird Sanctuary has one. So I'm going to go ahead and make an invoice for Amy's Bird Sanctuary. And I'm going to, oh, I guess they're not billable. I'm not seeing them here. All right. So I'm going to first start by adding just some, let's do this right. Okay. So I'm going to add my billable expense bundle here. But then let's say I have several different line items that I want to add in. So I'm going to make my line items. And again, if these were being pulled in from unbilled time charges um, or from billable expenses, you would just have them all import on. But if I don't want these two to show, I'm going to pick up the line and I'm going to drag it right under the bundle so that it's inside the bundle. And you can tell that you did it because line two is now way down here. So this is all line one. So now there's a grand total for the billable expenses of 1275. And if I go to print or preview this, then they don't see the concrete and the rock fountain. They only see, oh, I have to select a customer. Oh, that's why her stuff didn't come up. I didn't choose Amy first. Let's go add her custom design on this also. You know, back up, let's do this right. Add the billable expense, drag that also into the bundle. There we go. And now I'll print and or preview it. And what you're seeing, just to think about it for a second, I jumped the gun, there we go, is the client only sees billable expenses and they don't see all the line items. So that's um, a really, really slick technique that I use a lot for my job costing clients. I'll go ahead and I'll save that in case I need it again. So that is my hoot tip for that. Come on, let's go. There we go. All right, so there's my hoot tip. So we have about 10 minutes left. And um, there were so many questions back with the uh, with the QuickBooks checking account and QuickBooks payments. So I'm tempted to go there. If anybody has other yeah. things that they want me to. Um, I think this is where we want to go because there's still questions from the envelopes mm -hmm. and, um, and a primary ad, like primary admin, you know, who can access, uh, what do the envelopes do? One of the watch outs I think for envelopes is that it actually does take that money out of 
being able to be spent in your main checking yes. account, right? So you probably need to be a little, when you said be careful about it, you really do. It's not, it, it actually, it's almost like it's spent, right? When, yeah. you do, when you're doing your bills, when you're like printing your bill, you're printing your checks or sending off your payables. Yeah, let, let me see if I have a sample file that is connected to QuickBooks checking. I'm going to actually leave my test drive. And folks are asking about polls. We're, we're not, this is intelligible for CPE today, so we are not doing polls, um, but we're delivering a lot of great information. So hopefully that's still worth your time. However, if you'd like us to ask you a question, we can. So let us know what question you would like us to ask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's going to, um, I, I am on do not disturb. I don't know if I can get my, get my authorization code. Uh, I'm not going to be able to demo it. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, all right. So just let me kind of talk through about the, um, ab about the envelopes. So kind of big picture is um, the it's the administrate the primary administrator is the person who can sign up for the QuickBooks checking account and it is a real genuine bank account but it's different from the our traditional banking you know we've all kind of moved into this fintech industry with relay and all these digital banks that don't have any physical locations so the QuickBooks checking is with green dot bank but it's not actually like you can't ex access it through the, the Green Dot Bank website. You can only access it through your QuickBooks online. It's only available to your primary and company administrators. If you're using QuickBooks online for accountants, you can see it in the banking feed and you can view it in the cash flow, but you can't access it, get the statements, um, um, uh, transfer money or anything like that. Once you've connected the QuickBooks checking account and you are going to hear from your clients like, I didn't realize I connected it. You know, like it puts up a little ad for it in the banking feed or a couple interstitials. And then it says, hey, sign up and you click OK. And you do have to actually fill out a form. So anybody, if you've ever had a client who says, I didn't sign up for this. Yeah, they did. They just weren't really thinking about the that there were. I don't want to say re repercussions, ramifications of it, because it really did. You're like, oh, yeah, happen. how did that form get filled out? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, somebody actually um, uh, filled it out. Um, so then once you have the account, you can connect it to your QuickBooks um, payments and your QuickBooks um, payroll. But a big, big, big warning for you is that both of those two things have two two places to connect the feeds. One is saying to payroll, I want you to draw out of, or here's my payroll account and putting in the bank information. And the same with QuickBooks payments where you actually put in the bank information. But then there's a separate mapping that says my checks come, my wages come out of my this account or my QuickBooks payments go into this account. And I spend a lot of time cleaning up when it gets pointed to the wrong account. So you have to look in two places for those connections. Okay. So all of you now know that. Um, and then, but once it's connected and the money is going in, you have the ability to create envelopes. Originally was five, it's currently 10. An envelope silos off the money, completely separates it, pulls it out. You can't access it. It um, And this is why I was saying be very careful about balances, because if you're looking at the banking feed, you see the whole balance, including the envelopes. But if it says $10,000, you may only have $100 available. The only money that's available for use is the money at the QuickBooks checking level. If you've put money in an envelope, you, it's not, it's like almost like it doesn't exist except to get that 1.7%, 1.75% APY interest. So you have to physically see that transfer funds button on my screen. You have to transfer the funds out of the checking and into an envelope in order to get the 1.75% interest, but then it's unavailable. So when you're looking at these dollar amounts, when it says checking zero envelopes, zero, you have to really look at how much is available in the checking account and how much is socked away in the envelopes. 
if it's socked away in the envelopes and um and you know the checking says that you have fifty dollars in the envelope say you have five thousand dollars but you make a transfer for um you know five hundred dollars it's going to bounce because the checking is the only available in um, dollar amounts but for the profit first clients, this is absolutely beautiful because now you can make those envelopes and put the money in um, and, and you know put the, the owner's money away and the tax money away and the payroll money away. And then when it's time to pay any of those, you transfer it back out of the envelope and back into the checking in order to make the payment. Um, at this time, I think Donna had asked, there's no way to automatically um, move the money on a schedule. Um, so that's one of the limitations to that. Um, so um, that's basically how the envelopes work. So it does take some extra diligence to make sure you're managing it properly. But when you do, um, you know, like I said, I'm making more money on interest than I do at Bank of America. And then we've got some questions now um, regarding the check images. So can we bounce forward and go to the um because we a couple of people want to know whether there's a list of banks that support the check images i don't know if there is i have not yeah. seen a list of banks for this it's yeah. really in the early stages it's only been out for a couple months and yeah. there really doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason whether it's a small bank or a big bank that has it um i just always get excited when i do see it and if you're if you find that your bank doesn't have it um ledger sync is an app that will bring in check images so you can reach out to ledger sync and they they that's their specialty is bringing in those check images hmm. so okay. um that's an idea for you if you if you don't have you know if you're not able to do it through qbo okay yeah and so when you to know if you can see the check images see these numbers on the right hand side of the banking feed here you can see a 15 and a 2 and a 5 that's showing you how many images are attached and then when you click on that transaction you see the attachments down at the bottom you click on that bank attachment and you'll see it um, open up in a drawer on the right hand side and from there you can navigate to the the next one or you can just click on the attachments right down here to see them all okay um okay um and okay that's going back to quickbooks checking again all right there i saw another question about categorization history somebody wanted to see where that happened again um so categorization history will appear after you've put the payee name in on the banking feed if you've had previous transactions with them then you'll be able to um, see the categorization history and open it up to use it okay what other questions are coming in i think we've got we've got about three minutes so three if minutes, you've got right, some finals on how to get how to yeah. learn more maybe go to the resources that you have alicia okay. excellent so let's go into the wrapping up stage because we can you know and for those of you who know me you this know could literally go days <laughs> yeah. yeah and i'm yeah. always happy to talk forever it's just it's only so many hours in a day um okay so um you probably um oh no um, after the fact whoops here we go. Okay. So you've noticed I've got these little owls all over everything. Um, that's Owl Fred. A little secret about our owl is that his wing is a computer mouse. Um, here at Royal Wise, um, our owls is our on demand web based learning solutions. And we have um, over 100 hours of QuickBooks online training and another probably 70 hours of Apple, Macintosh, iPhone, and iPad training from my husband, Jamie. And we do live webinars and we do um, have on-demand classes. And so we have this whole roadmap. You've seen some of the links to some of the classes that I have relevant to today's topics, but I start you all the way back from, I've never even seen QuickBooks before, um, all the way up through um, intermediate and advanced bookkeeping. And it's not just for bookkeepers. This is, My classes are also excellent for your clients. So if you have that PETA client who is like asking you questions all the time, and you don't have the capacity for training, give me a call. <laughs> um, and so um, yeah. we're at learn.royalwise.com or the, the website's royalwise.com, but learn.royalwise.com is where all of this, 
um, the good stuff lives. Um, RoyalWise is authorized for CPE credit for our live webinars, and we are in the absolute final stages for the whole on-demand library being also available for um, CPE credit. So we're almost done with that. And all you have to do to get the CPE is take the quiz, watch the videos and take the quizzes. Um, if you um, are interested, I have my next live class coming up is on March 7th. I'm doing a class called Running Reports to Analyze for Growth. And so it's how to read a balance sheet, how to read your PL report, how to use all the settings in the reports, how to do percentage of income, cash flow statements, all of that good stuff. And again, it's good for your business owners who don't know what all those fancy reports yeah. mean. So you can come check it out. And all of this will be given in the. Um in the in the the pdf of the deck that we send out tomorrow mm -hmm. along with the recording so you'll have all of this as a resource for you absolutely yeah. great okay. and again well, so i call all of this fun new stuff look, look what, what I, I found, found. Yeah. and um you yeah, know thank you all for coming and i will look forward to seeing you in class yeah, and thank you, Alicia, so much. Um, I don't know, an hour with you just feels like 15 minutes. It just flies by. I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody else. Everyone stayed on till the very end. So thank you all for your time, your attention, and just all those awesome questions. I love how interactive you all were. So we'll see you again next time on another episode of this on The Grove. And, um, and I just, again, appreciate you, Alicia. And thank you very much, everyone. Bye Thanks bye. Thanks for having me, Allison. This was fun.